There's something in the air. I hear it in the distance. It sounds like cute new girls. Banger music. Oh crap, it's a new bang dream! If you can't tell, I've been a pretty big fan of this series for a while now. I think it does its job as a cute girl show with some really good music since it's done by actual bands. And Sanji Jen gave the series a unique style that reflects the game beautifully. The instrument playing scenes are still as astonishing as ever. This is another spin-off of the original series, focusing on a set of characters who recently went through a band breakup and how a sudden breakup like that can affect the people afterwards. Which is a new perspective for this series. Mostly zoning in on the quirky character Tomoe, trying to reset after believing she's the reason her band broke up in the first place. As she meets the positive transfer student Anon, who also had to reset for some reason or another. It's already done pretty well with this emotional drama so far, something this series has nailed in the past. And it already won me over with the character of Tomoe, who's quickly become a fast favorite in this series for me. The collecting habit that outcasted her as a kid to her finally gaining friends and something special to her, only for it to crumble in the end. Episode 3 really got me emotional, which I did not expect. I wasn't ready for a weirdly interesting but tragic character, only really enhanced by Sanji Jen's beautiful first person animation and Bandoi's emotional music making. I think this will be another add on to what's becoming a really good girl band series that anyone who likes that particular genre can enjoy. Give it a try, I feel it's been underrated for a while now. Ayaka is a story about bonds and wounds. Nah, I just wanted to reference the title. It's actually about this orphan who cut himself off from people because he has a superpower that he cannot control when he's emotional. This orphan is called to return to his hometown, an island called Ayaka, fitting name, and has to learn about these mysterious powers as well as the mystery surrounding his late father and his amnesia, specifically what happened on this island in the intro that we saw. I think it's an intriguing show, but the first episode can be a little information overload. The animation is pretty solid, and it has a really entertaining character dynamic with the introverted Yuki and the more careless and playful Jinji. Jinji is a complete menace to this dude in the entire episode. He just straight up ignores his backstory at one point, he stuffs him in a bag, he arrives at his school drunk as all hell. Like, you should really just watch the show for Jinji. I forgot to mention that the island is filled with these bubble looking things called Mitama, aka Spirit of the dead. And these Mitama can sometimes turn into all a Mitama and can cause problems. If any of you have ever played Persona, you'd know that the all a Mitama are the angry sides of a spirit. So I imagine they are the main monster in this show, since we kinda see a regular Mitama turn into an all a Mitama. There seems to be a winning theme about emotional outbursts with these powers. It's not the most unique thing out there, but if it explains more about its plot and continues the main duo's chemistry, I think it'll be a solid watch. Haha, <sighs> another Otome game, huh? You know how it goes. Japanese girl exists. Japanese girl gets hit by a truck. Japanese girl gets reincarnated in her favorite Otome game, where the Japanese girl happens to realize she's the villain and tries to amend her character before she ends up dying a gruesome death. The typical song and dance. I guess the most significant difference that sets this show apart from Hamifura and other shows of similar nature is that our little pride here is a lot more sadistic than any other protagonist before her. Her character ends up becoming the queen in the future and terrorizes an entire country in her reign. She also manipulates her adopted brother into killing his birth mother and making him her slave. So it makes sense that she demands the side characters to kill her at the slightest notion that she's evil since to any normal person that's pretty unjustifiable. Besides her evil video game self, Pride is a pretty sweet and normal girl who shows empathy for her brother for being adopted and self-awareness that she's been a dick to her workers in the past. She's also cute as a button, in case you haven't noticed. I guess another difference is that this series actually has a supernatural element to it. Each character has powers, such as Pride's precognition, which works well with her knowledge of the future from her time in the past. We'll have to see how that comes into play as the show progresses. But I like this show so far. These Otome games haven't missed for me yet. They can't keep getting away with this. Another generic isekai, huh? Alright, how does he die at least? Does he get hit by a truck? Does he get shot in the middle of the road? Sell me this. How, how does he die? What? You're not even trying! 
So the gimmick behind this one is the goddess made this dude overpowered as all hell, but since the magic crystals that say someone's magic power only go up to two digits, his parents misunderstand and abandon him due to being laughably weak, when in reality his level is in the thousands. He gets taken into a non-royal family with a cute little sister and befriends an anthropomorphic demon girl. So I'd say he won in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> Nothing I say will be funnier than this scene out of context. Not. One. Thing. So this series is really about a guy who thinks he's weak but is really the strongest the world has ever seen. I'm not sure why I would watch a show that offers nothing I wouldn't get from any other isekai. Who do y'all think I am? Some kind of loser? <laughs> on second thought, I'll give it three. You never know, it might be amazing later on, you know? Plus, the animation and art look pretty good, the character design looks pretty good, and the plot of the sister thinking he's a devil is interesting. Yeah, I'll, you know, because of those things, I gotta at least give it a chance. On a cold, rainy day, our people were starving, our wishes ignored, and our hope lost. Gone were the days of weaker to please our holy souls. With thighs so large, it is said to change the world. And thus our people were plagued to continue walking this land, with no thighs to please our useless lives. That is when a young one took a stand. He said, fellow worshippers of the thick thighs hive, I have stumbled upon thighs so large, it is said it'll keep all of us alive. With a spin and a twist and a flick of the wrist, he proceeded to follow his dick to a show that featured a girl with a stick. With thighs so bare, it was never even fail. To which the hero of the thighs finally said, Come children and wish upon these glorious leggings. Kneel down and maybe she'll hear our begging. And that is how a girl named Wiser saved my city. Now imagine I ended the poem saying something witty. Low key though, I feel this episode got 40 minutes for one reason and one reason only. Jokes aside, this story has a certain childlike charm to it about a kid who wants to go on an adventure, tired of the boring farming life that's been cursed upon her. But she and her friends realize that they're actually pretty weak, so our main girl, Liza, blessed be her thighs, decided to learn alchemy from this dude. Alchemy appeared to her when she learned about it, partially due to her adventurous personality, along with her friends also learning from them. Game adaptations can be pretty hit or miss, so we'll see how it goes from here, but so far I think it's good. The art is beautiful, the animation looks decent, the music was actually pretty good at points, and at the very least, it's wholesome enough to be simple entertainment. The vibes of friends adventuring is just sweet to me. I was actually relatively excited about this one. I don't watch a lot of trailers, but I did end up catching this one, and I thought it looked cute. Plus, it's a womcom, which is my wheelhouse. This show isn't incredible or anything, but it's the kind of adorable, relaxing show that makes me feel comfy. And I like feeling comfy. Their romance is pretty cute, the art style is also pretty cute, and the fact that the side characters are essentially cheering them on like we are is also really freaking cute. Surprisingly, this isn't an entirely pure watch. They love sex jokes. I also like how this is another romance that takes place in a work environment. I think it's a unique setting since rom-coms are typically in school. I suppose if there's one downside some viewers may have, it is the main boy. I already know how y'all get down with boys who are a little more socially anxious, and I do think he could be a little more interesting as a character. But I like how he showcases that nervousness sometimes doesn't just go away in high school, and even an adult can feel nervous in a romantic setting. Which this show handles pretty well for the both of them. It's a by-the-books rom-com with an endearing main couple. I'll take it. Now onto something on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. This anime tells the typical tale of the hero defeating the Demon King. Jump 10 years later and the king is resurrected, albeit in a childish, more chibi form. Also, yes, this is a guy. I wanted it to be a lolly too. We can't have nice things. He decides to check up on the one who beat him a decade ago, only to find a cancelled loser whose only similarity is his name. The hero went through some cheating allegations, and his reputation is completely destroyed. This is a pretty different spin on the whole bum getting taken care of by some kind of supernatural being trope, while also parodying the hero defeats the Demon King plotline. And the contrasting characters also work as a comedy. Speaking of the comedy, this show is sexual as all hell. Is that a motherfucking pocket pussy? It's almost like a compilation of different fetishes. Even Xenia is constantly dressed in one of those school swimsuits. For the sole reason of what I can only assume is... <laughs> okay. 
Sound guy. We made that joke already. I do love the idea that a bunch of very talented animators sat down and deliberately made that camera angle for no reason. And people wonder why I watch seasonal anime. As someone who's pretty childish and finds this kind of stuff funny, I think it has potential. Bro's about to beat it to Google searched bikini photos. Someone give my man a job code, my man is STRUGGLING out here! It almost reminds me of something Natsumi Akatsuki would think up. A degenerate parody of what is a pretty saturated genre, especially one that's usually pretty wholesome. The reason I'm not fully committing is because sometimes shows like this can get a little old, so I want to see if it holds up. But so far, I am a fan. Am I wrong for thinking this isn't as good as season 1? Now, episode 1, I thought was pretty good. It beautifully displayed Rudy's will to live degrading, his heartbreak over Aerie's leaving left a notable imprint on him negatively, and bumping into a girl who reminds you of the girl who broke your heart right after all that happened is pretty rough. Losing his former party seemingly broke him as it's really the first time he bonded with others like that. However, with every tie that gets lost, there are always new ones ready to form and this new party seems to have helped Rudy a lot, and the anime shows that nicely. A show don't tell approach as Rudy burning Aries' hair symbolizes his want to move on from her, as he looks at Sophie's pendant, ready to tackle the future. Then episode 2 comes along, and while I get what the series was going for, I really like the fact that Rudy still isn't quite over Aries yet, to me it just felt rushed. The pacing was one of the best things about this series because it's the build-up that makes scenes emotional. It's still good, don't get me wrong, but I love this anime a lot. I genuinely think it's the best isekai out there right now. With characters that are grounded, with issues that are understandable for their age or backstory that they can learn and grow from. A series that's not afraid to talk about uncomfortable issues that most shows wouldn't even touch. How sex is all over this anime, this anime embraces it. It normalizes it because that's how it is in the real world. Brilliant world building and storytelling, it embodies everything a fantasy anime should be. It's adventurous, it's fun, it's so interesting to learn about the different aspects of the world. Even smaller things like them having their own language between species, it's just a nice touch that really sells you on the world being real. Production that's amazing, even smaller things like the way the elements move and sound seem like they're actually there. And the drama! Drama that felt impactful. Drama that pulled you in. I'm only saying all this because I think I lost my chance to review this series and I want to hammer home the point that I love this anime a lot. And it's because I love it as much as I do that I have to be critical. So far, it just hasn't left the same impact as before. Sure, the downgrade in art sucks. Most of the staff were busy doing other shows, including director Okamoto, who's a big loss. But I already had a feeling that that was going to happen when I heard it. What worries me is the pace. Scenes end so quickly, how can I feel for the characters when it feels like the show just wanted to get through this arc as quickly as possible? It's just a lack of cohesiveness so far. With other series, it's not as big of a deal, but again, this is Mushoku Tensei we're talking about. So to see this weird drop off is really worrying. Blame it on my expectations, but it just hasn't hit the same, and I hope I was able to explain why. Still a top 5 anime of the season, this is a must watch. But I went into this season assuming it'd be an easy number 1 best anime of the season. I had a feeling it was gonna be anime of the year. Hopefully it gets better. At least this isekai has a pretty creative death getting murdered by falling pastries and all. Kinda brutal to be honest, all that glass and stuff. Anyway, this dude who makes pastries, you can tell he makes pastries because pastry is literally in his name, gets reincarnated as a child and wants to fill the land with sweets, but is having trouble actually making the sweets due to scarcer materials such as sugar. It's an intriguing concept that would have worked if it was more slice of life oriented, similar to something like A Sentence of a Bookworm Season 1. However, so far this anime doesn't seem to give off that kind of vibe, and it also seems to be washing. The first real arc is about how his home village is getting attacked by bandits, which does show off his battle strategy abilities and it's the introduction of his OP magical ability replication, but outside of a few scenes here and there and being the MC's motivation, it's hardly even about pastries. 
I get Booksakai isn't entirely about mind making books, but at least they go through the process and hold the drama off until later, allowing the viewer to be properly introduced. In episode 1, we're already getting into magic and battle strategies, and it's like, damn, chill out. Let this man introduce the characters to some cookies or something. I think the comedy works at times, and the art is fine for the most part, but I wish this series focused more on the act of actually making pastries, rather than the MC becoming a sweet loving Sun Ju for an entire episode. I get that the materials are scarcer, but again, paper was also scarcer in a sentence of a bookworm, and it's still focused on that. This anime feels like if a sentence of a bookworm started on the church arc rather than actually building up to it and making it emotional. I'll give it another chance just to see if it focuses more on it later, but for now, I'm kinda eh on it overall. Characters are pretty cute though. Every time I forget how Gohans makes anime until they make a show and I'm reminded of how they make anime. Controversial visuals aside, for now, the show really is cute. It's a simple romance about a girl who keeps forgetting her glasses, which might sound oddly specific upon first hearing, but it actually works really well with Mie's habit of getting really close to the main boy's face. And that twist at the end where she secretly had contacts in worked really well on me, and it made me a pretty big fan of her character. This show can be pretty funny because Mie is such an entertaining and playful character. Not to mention, who could a person personality mixed in with the weird comments at times make her one of my favorite girls of this season. Truth be told, under different circumstances, this would probably be one of my favorites of the season, but there's a major issue I have with it. Let me start this off by saying, I don't know animation. I've never animated in my life, but I do know it's a taxing process, and I also know a little bit about it to be able to comment on it. And the animation on this is the definition of doing too much. I usually don't go on tangents like this in these videos due to length, but it's kinda hard to talk about this show without talking about its production. While I do understand the purpose of the establishing shot, shows I publicly like have done this as well, but I don't think it came out well here. The movements can be pretty choppy, there's a particularly bad moment where a character cut into a scene rather abrasively, there's another particularly bad moment where the main character's hand doesn't touch the seat when he's sitting down, and I'm not sure if it's the camera angle or this weird fisheye effects Gohans loves to do, but at times it can be very nauseating. Having these shots where the camera just doesn't stop moving doesn't really benefit the series at all to me. If this was an action series meant to show excitement, that'd be one Thing. But this is a simple rom-com. The comedy isn't even wild, so it doesn't work in that way neither. And this issue continues throughout the episode. There's so many unnecessary pans and zooms for no rhyme or reason. Some of the camera angles are just weirdly placed which just makes you ask why. Usually when an anime does stuff like this, it's to visually tell the viewers something, but I can't think of a reason for these camera angles. Not to mention the backgrounds, some of the hail movements, sometimes the lighting, like it's just way too much. I don't typically complain about stuff like this, but usually I don't need to because most anime don't do stuff like this. It feels more like it's trying to show off rather than being an adaptation that actually fits the series. And I really hope that isn't the case. That's not to say it's all bad, the subtle movement in Mie's eyes is a nice touch and some shots actually look really good. I don't know why there are so many complicated moving shots when this show works best with simple movements and high quality close-ups. That's legit all you need to do. I get Gohans gets a lot of hate, but I'm not one of those people. I think with a series that works for it, like K, their style can be super memorable and stylish. But it just doesn't work with a show like this. And if it had a studio that excelled in simple but crisp animation like a PA works, a Shin A, or maybe even a Pine Jam, it'd work a lot better. I hope I got my points across well enough. Again, I'm not an animator. I just wanted to try and explain why the visuals didn't work for me since I noticed some people love it and some people hate it. Ignoring all that though, this series is once again really cute to watch, and if you're a fan of romances, I think this will work for you. Whew, complicated animation talk aside, let's talk about something a little bit more my speed. Another romance, baby. Basically, this dude, Sajo, has feelings for this girl, Aika. 
His feelings were so strong, he'd ask her out constantly and get rejected every time. He's been doing this so often, it's become part of his character. People know him for asking out Aika and getting rejected every time. I have to say, just real quick, that this is an anime. Don't do this in real life. The girl you like is not actually a tsundere. They will get a restraining order. I know from experience. Eventually, he had a sudden epiphany that he wasn't good enough for her. He was tired of getting rejected all the time, so suddenly he just stopped and kept his distance from her, leading to Aika believing that the sudden stoppage means he now hates her or something. It's a classic misunderstanding story. The human heart is complicated, huh boys and girls? I think it's fine for what it is. Animation can be a little weird at times, but I really like the art for each character. And I think the comedy works as well. Worst case scenario, it's a trashy romance, and those shits draw me in like a bad addiction. Here's another one that I was oddly hyped about. Basically, this dude gets reincarnated into another word as a vending machine, which to most may sound awful, since what does a vending machine do besides just sit there? But our main boy actually loves vending machines. I didn't know Sumeto Media was in this anime. <laughs> thank you, wow, thank you. Wow, I'll, I'll be here all day. I'm, I'm unworthy of your place. So Jokes aside, there is one way to make such a ridiculous concept work, which is to go all the way with it, which this anime does. The vending machine is powered by points that he gets from the money he receives, all of his power-ups involve changing his stock and lowering prices, and he has no attack abilities, with the only move he can kinda do being a god's blessing, which everybody has. Which even then he can only use the barrier for, which again just drains his points. He is an actual vending machine, and his capabilities are pretty much that of a vending machine. Which is so outrageous that it's funny. Besides that, I also like the main girl. She's very strong, but also has a cuter side, with her main weakness being her accuracy. I think she's very entertaining, and I would like to see more of her. And I also like how none of the characters know what a vending machine is. To them, it's this magical box that can talk and give you supplements. Which again, I found to be pretty funny. It's a really dumb concept that shouldn't work, but absolutely does, and I'm actually very interested to see where this goes from here. The vending machine won me over. Only anime, man. Well, trying to untangle this knot of emotional drama might be a bit of a pain. I guess we can start with the setting. This anime takes place in what I'll classify as old as hell Asia. Our main girl, Mio, is the product of a loveless arranged marriage. Once her mother died, her father brought in a new lover and her cunt of a daughter, Saya. This led to Mio's status in the family falling to servant level and her new family constantly berating her and her late mother. This led to her developing major pessimism and mental issues, that she must hide her emotions and do what's asked of her. Later on, we learn that her family is having two arranged marriages. Mio will be marrying a rumored-to-be cold, ruthless man, and Saya gets to marry a boy named Koji, who actually loves Mio. So to dumb this down, Mio will escape her abusive household only to potentially be in a loveless marriage, while the person who actually loves her and wants to help her has to marry the sister who constantly treats her like dirt. Yeah, that's the kind of show we're dealing with here. Luckily, it seems Kudo, the person Mio is marrying, is actually not that bad of a guy and is willing to help her with her confidence issues. Gotta say, this show poured me in emotionally. The music, the voice acting really did wonders here, and the production is pretty nice all around. It seems like it'll be a sweet little romance of someone whose life has been nothing but misery getting better and overcoming her issues both inside and outside her mind. Also, I guess there's psychic abilities, so there's that as well. Check this out if you like romances, it's pretty good. The so-called next big shonen, called that by yours truly, God, I hate myself. Continues onward with the new season, seemingly all about Gojo. Yes, the character with the OP ability that everyone loves. The season seems to go through his relationship with Suguru, the bad guy sorcerer. There is a notable but understandable decline since sung Park decided to leave Mappa to pursue his own studio, and he did a lot for this series during its first season and its movie, so obviously his absence is a big mark that we'll just have to get used to. Luckily, it doesn't seem like a major drop-off or anything. It actually still has a lot of quality moments in it. I was a big fan of the last series and its movies, so hopefully it keeps the momentum going. Let me just say that this is the first premiere so far that really hooked me in. Which might not say much since I'm so easy to please, but this right here? 
Oh, this got me good. This anime takes place in an alternate version of the Meiji era where monsters and the like exist. Our main guy is a half-human, half-oni mix whose oni powers are slowly consuming his human heart. When that process completes, that will turn him into an oni 100%. Our main boy... Sorry, Sugaru, bumps into an immortal named Aya, who wishes for him to kill her since she's just a talking head. I don't think living in a bird cage would be a fun time. Upon learning who made her like this, being the same person who seemingly tortured him and made him part Oni to begin with, the two set out on an adventure to Europe to find this guy, as Aya is using her immortal bodily fluids to keep Sugaru alive, to make sure he doesn't turn into an Oni before the mission is complete. Aya can get her body back and Sugaru can find the one who turned him into an Oni. Right away, learning about the word in this anime is extremely interesting, as the dynamic between a human and a monster is clear. Monsters aren't seen on the same level as humans and are mostly akin to gladiators, murdering each other for the sake of human entertainment. So Sugaru's mindset of being alright with his monster powers taking over during a battle and killing the crowd of humans kinda makes sense but you can also see how depraved his mindset really is. Which is something that made me fall in love with this character instantly. He's not against living or dying, but if he does have to die, he wants it to at least be entertaining. And putting those people in the same hell he lives through every day would be fun for him. I also just love how artistic these visuals are. A lot of creative camera angles, split screens, transitions that are smooth, the OP showcases the artistry very well. It all looks incredibly well made. The dialogue is also really good as well. I can't wait to see how this mystery develops, but the premiere won me over instantly. It's not gonna be for everyone, but if you like fascinating world building, fun but unique characters, creative but also fitting visuals, and a kinda sorta murder mystery, this one's for you. Here's the seasonal short anime that I'll be watching as sort of a palette cleanser. I kinda need one of these every now and again, plus these are usually hidden gems. I can't see it for this one specifically, but it is still interesting as it's about the mangaka, Hiromi Arakawa's upbringing as a farmer in Hokkaido before she decided to become a mangaka. Yes, the same Arakawa that would become the author of Jin no Saiji, and this other show, you may have heard of it, it goes by the name of Full Metal Alchemist. So yeah, if you're at all a fan of her works, you should check this out and learn more about her. I don't know why she represents herself as a cow, but yeah. There's even a funny little story about how her family grew up always drinking milk and how her parents would send some to her all the time when she was writing, which makes the fact Edward hated drinking milk that much more funnier to me. Even if you aren't a fan or don't really care, there are still some tidbits about farming and its process. So if you're at all a fan of her work or just have a mild interest in farming, it's a pretty easy watch due to its length. Before any of you Shady Shores patients get all mad since I know how some of y'all get about these remakes, I have not seen the original, so this is my first time seeing this series. So far, I think it's really entertaining, but also quite compelling. Mysteries such as Kenshin's past are intriguing to me, and I wonder what his deal is. I also think the dynamic between Kenshi and Karu works really well. Kenshin as a whole is just pretty fun, his mannerisms down to the weird way he speaks, and Karu is such a sweetheart, but that trustable nature of hers ended up getting her manipulated. Both of these characters work for me so far. I'm not sure what the overarching plot will be yet, since it just seems to be about a one wandering samurai coming to grips with his past, which in and of itself works for me, but usually shonen have more than that. Mixed in the fact that the music is bopping, the animation is pretty clean, the art looks really good, and we got ourselves a not bad remake so far. I am a little worried about the length, but usually remakes get multiple seasons nowadays, so it's not a huge deal. Not sure how fans of the original feel about this, but I like it so far. Another isekai where the dude who dies becomes a hero. Truth be told, this is just a painfully average isekai to me. Everything about this series is just not bad, but it's also not good enough to be notable. It isn't trashy funny, there's not much story to speak of, the art and animation look weak, the main character seems bland, like it's serviceable if you like isekai, but there's only so much isekai I can handle and this one was the weakest out the bunch. I do like how he can use his business knowledge in the fantasy world, that was pretty neat, but besides that, this anime gave me nothing and I'm not confident it'll be worth continuing past this point. Sorry. Well this is definitely interesting to say the least. 
This show takes place in a setting where 10% of the population are humanoids and this doctor treats them for their various issues. He also has a more underground persona, doing what is said to be illegal medical procedures on those who need help. It seems like a very serious anime with only slight bits of comedy thrown in there and it's definitely something that will make you think. The word is very interesting to learn about with various laws surrounding AI and it's the kind of series that may pull you in emotionally. These are characters needing to go to illegal tactics in order to stay with the ones they love. It's a psychological drama for sure that slowly builds mysteries and intrigue. It's definitely a smart project to take on for Madhouse. I also think the production works with a very nice art style and setting. I used to scoff at AI anime like this because I always thought it was unrealistic and kind of pointless to think about considering how far in the future it'd have to be. But seeing how quickly AI is advancing in our world and the show's message at the end of technology advancing faster than anyone ever imagined was quite the sobering thought. Maybe a reality where stuff like this exists isn't as far away as I thought before. I think it's at least worth the watch, but it's definitely something not everyone will enjoy. If you like slower, more emotional builds that are pretty dialogue heavy, give it a chance. I think it'll be a pretty underrated watch. Remember that big section of the video where I talked about how Gohan's animation style didn't fit with the glasses romance? Well here's a good example of what actually fits with Gohan's. Their style really works with an outrageous goofy comedy about a maid cat taking care of its owner, despite it being literally the exact same director as the glasses anime. There are still some eh moments like some of the camera angles and once you notice how often they pan or zoom, you cannot unnotice it, but it's still much more reflective and fitting of the chaotic nature of the show, showcasing how important choosing the right studio is. I also think the more slice of life scenes actually look pretty fluid. I don't know why Gohan doesn't do this more often honestly. The actual show is pretty simple but I think it works in a lot of ways. It's a very comfy show that's pretty funny, not much more to say about it. And the greatest anime of all time continues on. By my use of hyperbole, you're probably assuming I'm hate watching this series, but nope. At this point, if you're generally still watching this series despite saying you hate it, the truth is, there's a part of you that likes this shit. And that's okay, because there is a certain aspect to the series that makes it hilarious to talk about. I'm not entirely sure what it is. It's not the weirdest show out there, it's not a great romance, it doesn't have amazing characters or anything, but it's just, it's just funny. <laughs> Plus the art is pretty good. Shout out to Kape. We're continuing on with the movie plotline as Kazuya is determined to get this project funded for Chizuru. There's also a new girl who's been in the show for 10 minutes and already indirectly made Kazuya and Chizuru closer. This makes her the best character in the show by a mile. A character who has no feelings for Kazuya and helps progress the main couple. Do you not understand how badly this series needed this? I stated this in my review, but the movie making story has a lot of potential to be a solid route for this couple to grow off of, while also creating some funny moments. This arc has a lot of potential, and if TMS decides they want to split from the manga, which is what I'm hoping for, this arc should be the time to do it. Especially with this new girl. I've had critiques about this show in the past, but now's the time to really grow this couple if you still want this show to work. I never thought I'd be cheering for an anime adaptation to be different from the manga, but I think this is a reasonable exception. TMS does seem rather committed, but I don't know how many seasons this is realistically going to get. I'm not saying the show should get ultra serious, keep the comedy if you want, but it really should be reaching its climax Max now. But hey, manga readers have been saying that for a while now, so who really knows? I'm back on the train, baby. Wherever this trashy romance goes, just know I'm here until we run out of tracks. Alright, 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 I'm watching another isekai, I hear you. However, counterpoint, this dude got three women to join his harem in a single episode. And judging from the OP, three of the women in his total harem are lollies. One of them wears a bunny suit. Y'all understand what I'm saying, right? I can't just drop this. Plus, this dude gets reincarnated as a slime drop, which is kind of funny. This isekai is all about someone who has low stats but an insanely high dropping weight, so he gets a ton of loot whenever he actually kills something. The whole plotline revolves around getting rewarded for your work, something that the main character is not used to due to his previous life being more of a slave to the system kind of thing. It's cute, kind of funny, and it's actually not that bad. 
I want to see where it's going before anything, though. Characters are cute as all hell, though. I mean, come on. A lot of very intriguing concepts this season. Whether they all work or not can be determined, but I have to appreciate the chances some of these stories are willing to take. Trying to explain everything that goes down in this anime would be next to impossible in a reasonable amount of time. So to try and dumb this down as much as I can, the anime takes place on this island where students are ranked based on how many stars they have. They get these stars by playing different types of games. Typically, if you have 5 stars or above, you are seen as a higher up, with 7 being the max amount of stars you can get. There are also multiple schools on this island that are also ranked based on how many higher up students they have. So not only are the individual students prestige worth the amount of stars they have, but also the school's prestige as well. There are also these special stars that give various abilities. One of them is a red star which allows the user to make any lie a reality. Our two main protagonists, Hiroto and Rina, use the red star to lie in order to either accomplish their goal of finding their childhood friend, or hide a massive kidnapping scene involving their school's president's daughter. Well, that took a turn. Rina has to lie about being the president's daughter because the real daughter got kidnapped, and probably to avoid panic, they just pit another one until they find her. And Hiroto has to lie about being the strongest student in school by acting cool and arrogant, when in reality, he's a terrible one-star who lucked his way into beating Rina by an admittingly really randomly placed sprinkler. Who, remember, is lying about being the school president's daughter. So to everyone else in the school, this nobody beat a very high up student. Hence why this series is called Liar Liar. It's important to note that if Hiroto were to ever lose, his lie would be known by the person who beat him, who would also know Rina's lie. I think y'all can understand the ramifications behind if it gets out the score essentially lied and made someone who relies on hacking and cheating a 7 star student. It'll destroy their credibility. So he cannot lose. For the sake of Rina, the president's daughter, the school as a whole, and for his mission of finding his childhood friend. He has to lie and fake a personality for all of their sake. I hope that all makes sense and I was able to explain it well enough. It's kinda hard to talk about this show when you don't know what's going on. It's a mix of three pretty intriguing concepts blended into one, and it's probably the closest thing we're ever gonna get to a No Game No Life Season 2. I love Hiroto so far, it's so common in anime to have a Chad MC who thinks he's this badass, so it's pretty funny when someone has to act like that and is really not what he says he is at all. Every character seems really fun. I have a theory that this childhood friend Hirato is looking for is the president's daughter who got kidnapped, which would be a really solid way to tie all the conflicts together. At worst, I think this series will be fun, involving mini games and entertaining characters. My novel adaptations seem to be either the best or worst kinds of anime, because because a lot of them are very interesting ideas that are poorly executed, usually due to the studios and anime producers seemingly not knowing how to adapt them. And it does seem Lyo Lyo could head down a similar direction since the pacing seems pretty quick, but it's still definitely something worth keeping your eye on. Speaking of light novels worth keeping your eye on, this show is all about magic. Set in a school where only about 80% of the students survive due to the magic and their wars being that strict, the story follows a group of students. It's actually only 6 students, so who's number 7? Anyway, each of these students seem to be different. Some, like our main boy, are experts in magic and strategy. Some are book smart. There's even a girl who's against the treatment of animals that mages typically display. But by far the most interesting one is Nanao, a girl from a samurai family who has no magic experience, who's only heal off of a recommendation from one of the teachers. She's also been through a war, and I found her past pretty intriguing. Also, they take its magic wars very seriously here, detailing every little aspect and explaining the history behind everything. It's fine for now, but there's a looming darkness somewhere here that I just can't ignore. I can definitely see this series taking a turn later on. Considering how slowly the plot is moving so far, I wonder how far the anime will go before the anime introduces the main conflict. I think this is the best way to do a light novel adaptation. Take your time with it and really lean into the dialogue heavy nature. There's a subset of anime fans out there that will have patience for a slower burn. No matter what, this series seems good. 
Nanao is a major highlight, her personality is just really entertaining. Pete is another character that stuck out to me, playing more of the wannabe stingy nerdy kid who seemingly worked his ass off to get here. So it seems to get to him when he learns Nanao was here based on a recommendation. Maybe he thinks that she didn't really need to work to get here like he had to. This seems like a fun little weeb Harry Potter. I think. Isn't Harry Potter just magic and vibes? I've never seen Harry Potter. Uh, this anime. Yeah, it's fine, honestly. It's kind of like a goofy version of that Seven Blades show I just talked about. Just take away any interesting word building and make the pacing ten times quicker. Seriously, this first episode goes through so much shit, it makes Lyle Lyle blush. We learn about the Demon King, we learn about our main guy Blade and how strong he is. We learn about the top student Honest, she goes from hating him to liking him in about 10 minutes. We learn Honest is cursed from a sword, we learn how she got cursed by the sword and why she can't tame it. Then Blade pimp slaps the demon and allows Honest to take control of it. And it's like, damn, I just sat down. This girl's whole character got sped one in about 20 minutes. Backstory and everything. This is ignoring any comedic beats the show wants to hit as well. I mean, Hale and Mechi shows are always pretty quick, but god damn, we could have made an arc of that or something. I do really like Honest's personality though, and Sophie, for as little as we saw her, intrigued me. Blade is also kind of funny with his duncy personality. <laughs> That's the thing with this show, I can complain about pacing all I want, but I can't deny the fact that this is goofy as all hell. It really is a fun show when you don't take it super seriously. I'm gonna give it 3 episodes before I commit anything to it though, just simply because I'm not a huge fan of shows that are paced this quickly. But I'll give it a chance though, since the art is pretty nice looking, and again, it can be a lot of fun. I just hope it slows down a little bit. Let the meat simmer a little, you know? It's shows like these that make me never want to share what I do as a hobby. In a way, a show that knows it's being made for the most degenerate kind of people is pretty admirable. They know it's for those kinds of anime fans, and they're not trying to hide it at all. I mean, look at this OP. You know what kind of show we're getting into here. Y'all know that porno about an old guy getting molested by this girl? The, no don't do it, one. Don't do it. I'm a virgin. That's basically this anime in a nutshell. While the girls aren't eager to do him yet, again, we know where this is heading. The son of a sexual scumbag realizes women aren't necessary and tries to live without dating anyone. He falls in love with this girl who works for a nursery, finds out his predator father owes this nursery a ton of money, and now has to repay using his body. Considering the kind of show we're dealing with here, I think you can imagine what they mean by that. If you like to see sexy bitches being sexy, then yeah, I guess you'll like this. They even got a little kudere lolly in there, just in case all the giant tits were starting to get repetitive. Yeah, that's pretty much it. By far the premiere I was most hyped for, there's a reason I shouted it out in the Komi video. Team Kojima has been on something for the past few years, and now that they branched off into their own studio, I'm curious to see just how great they could become. If this is any indication, then they might be a top studio in the next couple years. Man, I haven't seen something zombie oriented in so long, and this brought me back right to a time where I couldn't stop digesting media involving them. But it also showcases a whole new perspective on this once pretty oversaturated trend. The positives of having a zombie apocalypse. This anime critiques the exploitative work environment. I don't want to spread rumors that might not be real, but a certain company does have a pretty similar logo to the logo used in the show to represent this exploitative company. And the anime industry does have a bad history with this kind of thing. I'm just saying, I don't think it's a coincidence. This series explores the topic of why someone would have an apocalyptic fantasy, a way to be free from the hassles of everyday work life. Seeing people you love get used and exploited like some object. God that boss character deserved a more gruesome death. Damn that guy and the people he represents to hell. You can critique the mindset, sure, it's indeed a little selfish, but seeing what this character goes through, that life in his eyes slowly disappear, the world becoming more 
more monochrome, the longer he works there. It's very easy to understand why he's so happy that he can finally leave his former life behind. The plot of Akira creating a list of what he wants to do before he dies and finally being able to experience those things is such a unique way to tell a story about a zombie apocalypse. I could be off on this, but I've never seen a zombie show or really any apocalyptic media get tackled in that way. Also, the visuals, god damn. Those splashes of paint and then when the world becomes vibrant for Akira again. There are so many creative transitions and first person views. There's this one scene where it just goes back and forth between smooth transitions, which just made me so happy. Hell, the smaller ratio can be reflective of Akira's cramped space, his lack of freedom in his own life. Even Akira throwing away his tie, which represented his motivation for his job. That subtle shot shows just how far he's grown to despise his worker's life. Honestly, Akira's whole progression in this first episode is great. From him being happy he finally was able to get the job he wanted, to the reality hitting him that this might be more abusive than it actually seemed to be on the surface, to then trying to play it off like it was all okay, to finally being so exhausted and depressed that he hated going to the job to the point he was having emotional breakdowns every morning, and then his many tries to kill himself in order to escape this kind of life. There's something very sobering and sad about that. This is why people are scared to enter the workforce. It's already been a long section and I haven't even talked about how well the side characters are, the music being a banger, even the depressing tale of Sayori dying before Akira could ever confess to her. Imagine how it must feel to be used for your body all the time and never ever knowing someone actually loving you purely. Hell, Sayori had more life in her eyes when she became a zombie than when she was alive. There's so much to love about this show so far. It's a new take on a genre that's always been seen as more of a tragedy rather than a gift, and it's takes on work culture, especially coming from people who worked in a studio as large as OLM. The idea of a zombie apocalypse freeing you because your reality is that terrible it's just cold, man. It's almost scary in a way because I'd imagine they're all people who think the same way as Akira does. Or at least have had those thoughts in their head before. If there's one premiere you're gonna watch from this video, make it this one. It's so worth your time. Exploitation and controversy surrounding OLM aside, it is funny this aired directly after an anime made by a bunch of ex-employees called them out big time, but they are good at this anime thing. Kitaro is someone who's always been haunted by ghosts and spirits of that nature, and he has to tutor his friend's cousin, who's a genius Kudere Lali, who also has a big interest in the occult. They hunt down various ghosts together, with the main goal for the Lali to eventually find her dead mother's spirit that was taken away by a ghost when she died, and eventually bring her back to her father so I'm assuming they can both pass happily together. As someone with a love for the horror aesthetic, I think this works really well. The color shift to a more drab color and that grainy effect creates a pretty creepy vibe, especially when you're watching it at night with the lights off. I'm not gonna say it's this skin crawling terrifying show, I can really only point to a few anime that can do that for me, but there is a dark atmosphere surrounding this anime that I cannot ignore, especially with that ending of the lolly seemingly torturing the spirit and the ghosts all being scared of her. Plus, Eiko's complete personality switch to a more sadistic side almost left me speechless. It can also be a pretty decent comedy since the two are complete opposites. This intrigued me enough to watch 24 episodes of it. I love it so far. Mecha anime can be fun when they wanna be, and I got high hopes for this one. Set in a post-apocalyptic futuristic setting where this poisonous rain suddenly came down and contaminated most of the mainland, while also creating these monsters, our people have built an underground dystopian city where we fight these monsters inside of these robots controlled by AI called Magus. Our main boy finds one of these Magus, so now he can finally be the monster hunting robot pilot that he always dreamed of becoming. Oh, and his main goal is to find this city that may or may not exist. So there seems to be a little adventure in store for us as well. I think this show is killer so far. While the CGI isn't the greatest, the movements are pretty fluid and the monsters are detailed. The side characters aren't the greatest either, but I really like Kanata and the mystery surrounding Norwalk should be interesting. 
I liked how throughout the first episode, they play this becoming a man gag over and over again since Kanata randomly brought in a naked woman. But in reality, Tokyo meant becoming a man as in he finally has the opportunity to live out his dream now that he found a Magus to control his robot. I thought that was a pretty solid bait and switch at the end of the premiere, and it shows the more playful side of Tokyo's character. The comedy is actually weirdly adult oriented, something I did not expect. And the final thing is the soundtrack sounds sounds really good. Even in just episode 1, the track during the first fight was cool, and then the track after it was very chill. I want to see where this goes from here, and if you like mecha and more sci-fi-esque stories, well here's an anime for you. Outside of the name of the main character and the show sounding like the sound someone would make if they coughed and hiccuped at the same time, Helk is pretty fun, and I mean that for both the character and the show itself. It's a goofy little comedy set in a world where the Demon King has been defeated, so the secret demon government body thing decides to host a tournament for the next Demon King. Only for a human who hates his own race so much it'll make Uncle Ruckus blush to become the favorite to win the entire thing, as every demon besides one of the elite demons, Vamilio, seems to be down with it. Outside of the comedy, which is pretty funny, the actual plot seems to be intriguing as well, since we find out Helk is wanted for murdering the hero who killed the Demon King, who also just so happens to be his brother. We still need to learn the reasons as to why he did that, as well as the reason as to why he switched sides to begin with. The production does leave a lot to be desired, but it's decent enough to not ruin the show or anything, and it is 24 episodes, so I expect this series' pacing to be a more of a slow burn. So if Helk's reason is more emotional, it'll hit harder. I like this a fair bit so far. It's the right kind of silly that just makes me laugh, especially with Helk's personality and Vamuro's role as the straight woman. It's just entertaining. Devil's a Part-Timer Season 2, which is actually Season 3, but it's Season 2 for the studio working on this project, which is why it's called Season 2 in parentheses sequel, but it is still the third season, so I don't know why they didn't just call it the third season. How weirdly confusing. It's fine. Like, the art is what the art is now. It's bland, and it's an obvious drop-off in quality, but we knew that already. I just hope it sticks to being a painfully average-looking show, because when it tried to go outside the box last season, it failed hard. Just stay consistent and let the comedy and characters carry the show. We're continuing on the story from last season, mysteries involving the other world and Amelia's parents. Chi is now learning magic. It's still a pretty funny show due to the voice acting, and there's still Alice Wamis. God damn, she's adorable. Also, Ashia and Rika, they're slowly becoming my favorite thing on the show. It's not great or anything, definitely not up to the first season standards, but I like too many of the characters to write off this series just due to a bad adaptation. It's a weird place to be in. Hopefully it's better, but I don't have super high expectations. So a pastor and a saint work for a church. Everything's fine and dandy until we learn that the saint is actually a clumsy and love-struck girl who despite the pastor's overprotective nature, wants to do stuff with him because she loves him. It's the pretty typical romantic affair, but it has a rather different setting of a church inside of a fantasy world where stuff like cock-blocking angels exist. I love the main girl. She can switch so easily between various different personalities. It's pretty easy to win me over, I don't know if you've noticed. And I think it should be a pretty cute and funny romance to keep track of. There's not much else to say yet. This season is very captivating as a whole. A lot of shows have such unique stories and interesting settings, ranging from funny comedies to murder mysteries to gripping character dramas to hard-hitting truths of our reality in the present, to setting the path for a future that may be closer than we all expect, to banging hoes, to being lonely, to hunting Hunting ghosts, casting spells, and whatever the hell Classroom for Heroes is, this season has it all. And while all of these concepts may not be executed as well as others, I can at least be excited about them for now. So let's go through the top 10 list and see which anime I like the most. Keep in mind that this is only for the first few episodes and could change over time. At number 10 I have Liza. At number 9 I have Helk. 
At number 8, it's Gene of AI. An anime that might not be for everyone, but it is definitely for me. At number 7, we have Wayne of the Seven Blades. Kind of funny that this ended up at number 7. I didn't do that on purpose. At number 6, we have Dog Gathering. At number 5, we have My Happy Marriage. At number 4, I have, surprisingly, Mushoku Tensei. I'm shocked it's not my number 1 this season, but it's still a very good isekai that features some of my favorite characters. At number 3, it's Undead Murder Force. Maybe a surprise to have it over Mushoku Tensei. It was very close, but I'll take the risk and believe in the premiere. At number 2, it's Jujutsu Kaisen. And at number 1, my favorite anime of this year is Zom 100. Yeah, it may be risky to have a premiere number one, especially above Jujutsu Kaisen, but so far, I love this series. And of course, in the Winter Girlfriend tier, we have Winter Girlfriend. Quite frankly, it is unfair to compare other anime to Winter Girlfriend. It is a step above all these simply because it is fun to talk about, and it is the greatest anime of all time. Don't ask any questions, just accept it. That's it, thanks for watching, and I'll see y'all next time.